Well, um, over 2,000 years ago, the Greek philosopher Aristotle defined a good life as a virtuous and happy one. Now, today it doesn't seem so straightforward. Last March, before the lockdown, the, the average ratings for life satisfaction and happiness across the UK fell for the first time in 10 years, and it is no surprise they've continued to fall ever since. We had uh, some indications of why in the previous debate. Do we have a right to happiness? Professor, pr professor? <laughs> professor <laughs> Richard Layard, um, how can we be happier as a society? Well, I think the obvious thing is that uh, to have a happy society, uh, you've got to have people pursuing more than their own happiness. Uh, because you will, will have a happy society when people are spending a lot of their time uh, making other people happy and getting their own happiness uh, from that. But that's a cultural revolution, I think, that we need. Because if you think, what are we telling people, telling young people now? They should be trying to do better than other people. They should have better grades. They should have better jobs. They should have better incomes. If, it's a co if life is just a competition, for every winner there's a loser, the sum is zero. You cannot make a happier society uh, unless people are trying to pursue something that's a positive sum, getting their happiness from making other people happy. And that's possible. Well, the Soviet Union attempted to make happiness ubiquitous, didn't it? Sorry? The Soviet Union attempted to make happiness for oh, everyone. Oh, that's top down. Now, this has got to come from the bottom from up. From the bottom. Of course, this is to do with people's values. And I think it's to do with people understanding that actually the way to become happy, the most uh, uh, sure way to become happy, is to make somebody else happier. Uh, I belong to this movement, you, you noticed it uh, on the way in, called yeah. Action for Happiness. Uh, so this is promoting the members, we have 200,000 members, they have promised to try and create as much happiness in their life as they can, and as little misery. And when they take this course, you know, we've done a proper trial, and the effect on their own happiness wow. uh, is bigger than if you get a, a job or find a partner. So the, the secret, I think, which we want to get across as the fundamental value of Britishness, I would say, is getting your own happiness from making other people happy. Isn't there an old song, make someone happy? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there is. Mm. So it's about make up, because people do say if you help others, you do feel better about yourself. Yeah, That's I mean, a, there's, there's plenty oh, of evidence. Yeah. The altruistic people are happier than more selfish people. More selfish people, less altruistic people, whichever way you want to look at it. Emma, yeah. as a Buddhist nun, you yeah. very much lived in the material world as mm. a financial analyst, haven't mm. you, in, mm. in New York. Now, the spiritual world. When we're looking for happiness, where does it reside? So happiness requires us to have basic needs met. I mean, we need to have shelter and food, somebody caring for us, etc. Once those elements are there, uh, we can cultivate a sense of contentment, the riches of contentment from those things. And then from there, it's really about the state of mind that we cultivate. And as Richard has said, within that state of mind, compassion, actively uh, wishing that other beings' uh, lives are free from suffering, uh, is absolutely essential in developing your own mind of consistent contentment and happiness. Mm. So what about who should be making us happy? Because remember, David Cameron, was it, in 2010, introduced this, uh, this happiness in index. Mm. He didn't look so happy, did he, after the <laughs> referendum result, <laughs> did he? But is, is that what governments, yes, well steered uh, to you, Richard, is well, that what I mean, governments should be doing? Is, this is, of course, the great idea going back to the Anglo-Scottish Enlightenment, that the job of the government um, is to help uh, the people to lead a happy life. In fact, that's the only point we have a government, is to create the conditions for happiness. Difficult to implement until recently, but now we've got this new science of happiness. And we know a lot about what causes happiness. The number one is mental health, and then physical health. Next is human relationships, family, work, community. Income is third. Yet politics is so focused on income, we need to have much more uh, effort from the government to help people uh, with the, 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 the relationship problems, and of course their health problems. And we've got evidence-based ways of doing this. So we've got really good mental health treatments, not just the ordinary problems, but addiction, 
family conflict, uh, physical violence in the home. All of these are mental health problems for which good treatments exist, but almost nobody's getting them. That's what is so shocking. That's real discrimination. The great change we've got to have is there. We've got then to have schools. They've got to have an equal objective of the children's happiness mm. and the academic achievement of the children. They've got to uh, have proper uh, professional life skills teaching. All of this, all of this is a government's job. So it's a social issue. I believe that a political party, including the party that Andy and I belong to, uh, but any other party that adopted this would get a surge of support because they'd think, now at last, these politicians are connecting with the things we worry about <coughs> from day to day. Our family. Uh, and not, not, just, things uh, ju not just the sort the of matter. objective yeah. conditions.